This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Stacey Clardy. Today I'm speaking with the winner of the American Brain Foundation 2023 Ted Burns Humanism in Neurology Award. This year's winner is Professor Deanna Saylor. Deanna is a neuroinfectious and neuroimmunology specialist with a special interest in the neurological complications of HIV infection. I think many of us know her best for her work in global health and neurology, where she's focused on gaining a better understanding of the neurologic disease burden in resource-limited settings and on improving neurological education of neurologists and non-neurologists in those resource-limited settings. She's also worked on improving the care of patients with neurological disorders really across the globe. And she has ongoing research collaborations in Uganda and Zambia. She's previously lived and worked in in Kenya. Deanna was nominated by her colleagues and ultimately named this year's recipient of the Ted Burns Humanism Award. And this award specifically honors a member of our neurology profession who exhibits humanism through humble leadership, advocacy, innovation, and creativity. Ted Burns was the founder of this podcast over 15 years ago. Ted ultimately passed away almost a year ago after a decade-long battle with metastatic cancer. So Deanna, so very few of us are described as possessing all these traits, as, as really being humanistic and a humble leader and an advocate and an innovator by our peers. And you've been described to be all of these things by your nominators and your letter writers. So today I'm hoping You'll share with us about your background and and maybe some wisdom you've learned along the way in your career so far. So thank you for joining us and congratulations. Thank you so much, Stacey. It's quite an honor to be here. Thank you to the American Brain Foundation for this really humbling award. And, And of course, I'm just so honored that my colleagues nominated me as well. And they had some fantastic things to say. But first things first, how did you become interested in neurology? So my interest in neurology really came from personal experience. My mom was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 1990 when I was in second grade. And she had a pretty severe and progressive course. And this was before we had a lot of disease modifying therapies. And so she was in a wheelchair by the time I was in third grade and basically required total care by the time I was in high school. And watching her battle with MS and watching her interactions with her neurologist, some of who were fantastic and amazing and some of who were not. It really helped me to see what a difference having a really compassionate and caring and understanding neurologist could make, not only for the patient, but also for the family of the patient and really helped me to understand that neurologic disease doesn't just impact the patient themselves, it impacts the entire family. And so I decided when I was in high school that I wanted to become a doctor. And in particular, I wanted to become a neurologist and help people with similar disorders. And so that really led me on my trajectory. And my mom actually ended up passing away when I was in medical school. And so still, you know, really dedicating my career and my work to her memory. Wow, I had no idea. That's a tragic story, but I'm sure your patients and colleagues alike would agree that they're glad to have seen you make your career out of that. I think sometimes I forget the children sitting in the room with patients, right, may in fact be the most likely candidates to be our future neurologists. And and your story certainly sheds light on that. Obviously, the impact started when you were, I mean, what, second grader, so eight or nine years old, huh? Yeah, I think that's so true. I mean, I think we we forget that there are lots of eyes watching us when we're doctoring and, and we can really make an impact um, not only on our patients, but on their families. And, and we may never know the extent of the impact that we have on their lives. And so you are a neuroimmunologist, but you've devoted a tremendous amount of effort in a slightly different direction than, say, a traditional career in MS, I think, or at least that's what I've learned the most about in the work of yours that I've observed over the past several years. At what point did you sort of turn from the original inspiration, perhaps, to go into neuroimmunology of your mom's disease and move more toward the neurovirology and and the global health and global neurology? I think it was sort of two different lines kind of emerging. 
As a medical student in my first year of medical school, we had an intro to clinical medicine where we were assigned a physician to shadow for 10 weeks. And I was lucky enough to be randomly assigned to shadow Justin MacArthur, who I think many of you know is the chair of the Department of Neurology at Hopkins and an amazing neuroimmunologist and neuro HIV specialist himself. And I just loved going to his clinics and I ended up going to his neuro HIV clinic with him. And I was just really drawn to the population in Baltimore that had HIV and these neurological complications and also often had comorbidities like mental health comorbidities or homelessness or substance use disorders. And I just really felt like there were so many different ways that I could make an impact, not just on their neurological disease, but also their other comorbidities. And... I think the second thing was that when my mom died as a medical student, MS felt a little too close to home for some time. And so I still really love neurology and really loved the brain, but I had a hard time sitting and seeing MS patients all the time or imagining myself just being around MS every day, all day after that. And so I decided to veer kind of slightly away and, and focus more in the neuro ID, neuro HIV realm of things, although still keeping my foot in the MS world. And I did still complete a, a combined neuroimmunology, neuro ID fellowship. Since I've moved to Zambia, I've actually pivoted back towards MS quite a bit and raising awareness to the fact that MS actually does exist in sub Saharan Africa. Really, I think it's that neurologists generally don't exist in sub-Saharan Africa. And when you put an MS trained neurologist in Zambia or in another country in sub-Saharan Africa, suddenly there are patients with MS. Now it's been, gosh, 15 years since my mom died. And so I feel like there's enough distance where I can be in that MS world again. And also I'm in a place where we have very few treatments for MS and I can work hard to provide the best care possible for those patients to make sure they gain access to highly effective therapies, to make sure they're getting the symptomatic treatments that they need, and to really try to improve their quality of life. And so it's sort of come full circle, and I feel like I'm more directly honoring my mom and her legacy in my work now day to day. Wow, I should say so. There's a lot that you touched on there. One thing, of course, is mentorship and the absolutely pivotal role that the right mentor at the right time can play. Again, you know, not just being the child in the clinic room, but then as you progress through training, right, with your mention of of Justin MacArthur, and I I know he certainly played that role for a lot of people. You're currently living in Zambia, are you? Yes, we've been living in Zambia full-time for just over five years now. Yeah, I think it highlights how important it is to have someone with expertise in an area As you know, we talk about this a lot in autoimmune neurology too. When an autoimmune neurologist shows up, they say, goodness, we're not going to have enough business for you, but if you build it, they will come is sort of the response and always true. And obviously your presence there is pivotal and probably I would imagine quite rewarding. You know, sometimes we think in MS, there's been just such tremendous headway with so many FDA approved treatments, right? But if you can't get them for your patients, that really is for naught. So what treatments do they have access to in in Zambia readily available that you can get for your patients? We've been really lucky in the past couple of years. Zambia has launched a national health insurance scheme and they actually cover rituximab now. And so almost all of our patients are on rituximab. But prior to the launch of the National Health Insurance Scheme, we only had access to azathioprine and methotrexate. And so those were the drugs that most of our patients were on unless they could afford to pay for rituximab out of pocket. And there were only a few patients who could actually afford that. Wow, that's fantastic, really. So that is a state of the art in terms of availability of of a high efficacy therapy. So That's great news. And I'm going to guess you didn't say this in your answer, but did you have a hand in that? Well, we had a hand in getting it approved for MS. They had already approved it for oncological disorders and it was available in country. And we were able to work with the National Health Insurance Scheme to get MS added as an indication. 
This is back to the humility portion of the Ted Burns Award. <laughs> Glad that I asked you because you weren't going to say it. That's fantastic. So along those lines, over the course of your career so far, and you have accomplished a great deal in, in a relatively short period of time, what has been the most rewarding project or undertaking you'd say that you have been involved with? So this is a very easy question for me. So when we moved to Zambia in 2018, it was to start the first neurology residency program in Zambia. So prior to that, there were kind of three to five expatriate neurologists in country at any one time, and they were providing the entirety of neurological care to 18 million Zambians. And most of them were primarily doing research. So they had outpatient clinics, they had, they had launched an EEG lab and an EMG lab and had really improved access, but there was no inpatient neurology unit and there were no local neurologists. And so I was able to design a curriculum for a neurology training program that was approved here and then launched the program in October of 2018. And in the past five years, we have trained nine Zambian neurologists, so seven adult neurologists and two pediatric neurologists. And we actually have 10 trainees currently in our program who will be graduating in the next two years. So we'll increase to 19 neurologists that we've trained. And another exciting thing is that this year for the first year, we have international trainees coming to train in our program. So we have a trainee from Liberia who will be the first neurologist in Liberia when he returns. And then we have a trainee from rural Tanzania who will be the first neurologist in his region of Tanzania, 14 million people, when he returns to Tanzania after training here. And so it's really, really exciting to see how this program has revolutionized care for neurological disorders within Zambia. You know, we have a, an inpatient unit at the National Referral Hospital that is either the busiest or second busiest unit within the Department of Medicine each month. We see a, a huge volume and, and high acuity of neurological illness. We have a very busy outpatient clinic now that, that serves hundreds of patients a week. And now we're starting to see that we can have a regional impact and you know, really hope that we become a, a regional training center to start sending out neurologists to these other countries in sub-Saharan Africa that don't have neurologists or have very few neurologists and don't have training programs. And I really hope that the next step after starting to train international trainees is sort of the Zambia program becoming the hub for training, but then starting to support training centers in Liberia, in rural Tanzania, in Botswana, in these other surrounding countries, so that then local training programs can also develop and we'll really see this sort of wave model where Zambia started with this ripple and these waves move out and, and really revolutionize care for patients with neurological disorders across sub-Saharan Africa. Because we know that right now there are fewer neurologists in sub-Saharan Africa than in any other world region. So currently in the U.S. there's over five neurologists for every 100,000 people in the population. And I know we still talk about shortages of neurologists even in the U.S., but in sub-Saharan Africa, on average, there are 0.02 neurologists for every 100,000 people. And in some countries, there are no neurologists at all. And so I think seeing this program grow and build and flourish and start to have such an outsized impact has just been really, really incredibly rewarding. And I think most rewarding of all is seeing the trainees and the graduates of our program just really, really develop into excellent clinical neurologists, excited academic neurologists who are invested in performing research and generating locally contextualized data that they can then apply to their practice and their patients to improve patient outcomes and really, really just see this program grow and build has been by far my proudest accomplishment. Wow, that is tremendous impact. And we talked a lot with Ted about impact, right? About scaling efforts and things. And wow, that's just case in point of a tremendous impact, right? It's essentially every neurologist trained is is having a, I dare say, like a logarithmic impact on public health, right? And to continue to grow the program and you're now designing the spoke model. And that's just fantastic. That's several 
people's worth of um, career effort, and you've sort of managed to achieve that. Do you sleep much? <laughs> no, I definitely do not sleep much. Um, and I Appreciate think my your candor e there. <laughs> my emails at odd hours probably, you know, show that truth as well. What is maybe your biggest regret? If you have any regrets in your career to this point, or, or maybe if not a, a regret, something you would change if you could? I'm not sure I would call it necessarily a regret, but I think a lesson that I wish I had learned earlier. When I think back to kind of my first year as a brand new attending after finishing fellowship and I was at Hopkins and just feeling like I had to, I was an attending now. And so I had to be able to do things on my own and I had to be able to know things. And, you know, it took me some time to realize that that wasn't true at all. And I had a, a fantastic group of colleagues who all had different strengths and knowledge bases and approaches that I could still learn from. So I think just that humility and the and confidence actually as an attending to say, I am where I'm supposed to be. I am qualified to be here, but I still don't have to know everything. And I can still use my colleagues to make sure I'm providing the best care possible to patients. And then I can still learn. And I think that's something that I really try to pass on to all of our program graduates here in Zambia who are now junior faculty in our program and to our current trainees is that we all have strengths and we all have knowledge gaps and we all need to keep learning and to never be afraid to ask for help, to ask for a second opinion, to ask for other ideas, you know, and, and I think that's so important, especially in neurology where we're still learning so much all the time and there are still so many patients who end up in the sort of I'm not sure category and being willing to seek other opinions and collaborate to make sure we're providing the best care to our patients, I think is so important. I think many, if not most of us go through that when you're a, a new attending and, and you're like, okay, I've got this. I can, I, I went through all these years of training. I can now answer all the questions, right? And, and it's simply not true. And yeah, I wish I had gotten that advice. <laughs> Yeah, it's so true. And, and, you know, I think imposter syndrome is so real. And um, we often are just afraid that somehow asking for help or asking for a second opinion somehow invalidates what we've done or who we are. And that's just, you know, the opposite is true, I think. Let me follow up on that a little bit. So let's take it into the patient room. So when you're in the hospital or when you're in the clinic room, what are the essential one or two things that you've learned as well over the years that you always try to remember to do in each encounter that you have with a patient? So I think it, it really boils down to two things for me. So one is keeping the patient as an individual person in the center. And so I think that that can seem daunting, but really kind of building that personal relationship with the patient doesn't take a lot of time, it just takes a sincere effort. And so I try to jot down something about that patient, whether it's, you know, that they have a grandchild that they're very excited about, or, you know, children that they're excited about, or a job or a pet or whatever it is that I can learn about them in that first encounter that I can then ask about in their second encounter. So I think that's really important to me as I start a patient encounter. And then probably from my own experience with my mom having MS and, and realizing that it impacts the whole family and impacts kind of every dimension of a, a patient's life. The other thing that I always try to do as I'm closing a visit is to tell the patient that they're doing a good job and especially to tell any family caregivers that are there with them that they're doing a good job, you know, and just really seeing people and seeing the effort that they're making to be resilient and to keep living despite the circumstances that they found themselves in. I think it just makes such a difference and, and really people feel seen both, you know, as we're beginning the encounter and again, as we're wrapping it up. Wow, that's a great one. I do not do that second one enough. I do not tell them that they're doing a good job enough. I'm going to take that one with me. I want you to imagine you're a young attending now, this year, 2023, knowing what you know now, knowing the, the spaces you've worked in, the things you've accomplished, where would you direct your energy 
if you were just graduating now in the field? And I guess really what I'm asking is, what do you think as neurologists maybe we should be focusing on the most right now? I think that we are lucky in that neurology is still a fairly young and developing field and there's still so much to learn. And yet there are also disorders that we've known about for forever. So I think there's so many opportunities to really impact the field that the advice I would give someone is to really pursue their passion, you know, and if you're interested and excited about basic science, then go into the basic science realm and discover that new genetic underpinning or the new drug um, for some rare disorder. And if you're interested in clinical research, then be a clinical trialist and help bring new drugs to market. If you're an implementation science person, help us figure out how to get the evidence-based treatment out into routine care. And if you're an excellent clinician who loves being in the room with the patient, then go be in that clinical space and help to make that patient's life that much better. And so I think there's probably no one direction that everyone should be focusing on, but really just identifying what it is that you're passionate about and pursuing that wholeheartedly with all of your energy as you begin your career. You know, and you haven't said it in your advice, but I cannot imagine that along your pathway, because what you have done is so unique, that you were not told by some people not to. I'm sure you must have been discouraged at some point along the way. And I feel like in your advice, you've maybe flipped that on its head and said, do exactly what you want to do, whether or not anyone's doing it. Am I fair in my assessment about that? Yes, you are definitely right on on that. I mean, I had many, many people tell me along the way and people who were fantastic mentors and career guidance counselors for me who said, oh, I'm not sure about this. You know, I think there are easier ways to do this. You know, maybe you should go into infectious disease instead of into neurology because the infectious disease world has been in global health for a long time or you know, maybe just focus on inner city populations in the U.S. because there's a lot of health disparities there and need there. We're really not sure that this is a pathway that can work in academic neurology. And that was really impactful, especially because they were coming from people who I knew cared about me and knew me and wanted what was best for me. And so it was hard to sort of strike out against that. I was really lucky in that I had a couple of role models who had already done that. So in particular, Gretchen Burbeck at the University of Rochester and Anna Claire Meyer, who was um, at that time at UCSF and then later at Yale and, and now as an industry, had also really struck out and was living in Kenya and, and pursuing a global neurology career at that time. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it, it took a lot of courage to say that this was not the most straight and narrow path, but it was the path that I really wanted to be on and that I was willing to take the risk and try to make it work. And I'm so thankful, you know, looking back that I was able to make that decision and that I had role models like Gretchen and Anna Claire who I could follow in their footsteps and know that they had blazed that pathway and that they were there to support me as well. I'm hearing a lot in what you're saying, and that is that you really had to pick mentors for each aspect of what you wanted to do, especially because you were doing something for which there is not an established pathway per se, but also probably a lot of people close to you cared about you and, and worried, would you be exhausting yourself? Would you be um, really making life difficult, right? And so I think parsing out when people perhaps are, you know, looking out for you as a person and not necessarily seeing your vision, right, is, is a big challenge, especially when they're people you care for. So I think from a mentee perspective, I hear you saying, like, go for it. Like, if this is what you want, go for it. And the lesson for mentors is be careful what you say, because it can have a big impact on folks, positive or negative. Yeah, I think that's true. It's a really now in kind of the mentor role, it is a really challenging tightrope to walk, right? Because you want to support your trainees goals and ambitions, but you also want to make sure that they are somewhat realistic. You know, you don't want to send a mentee or a trainee out on a fool's errand either. And so really thinking 
and critically about your own feelings and your own doubts and whether you're projecting your own insecurities or your own worries onto them or whether they're genuine concerns that this really, really is very unlikely to work out in any circumstance, I think is really important as a mentor because it it definitely can have a big impact on what trainees think is possible and what they choose to pursue. So well said. You have been incredibly productive and you continue to make significant contributions and hopefully will for a very, very long time. Do you have, as we wrap up, you know, one or two pieces of wisdom on anything else you want to share? I think, you know, my advice, some we've already talked about, you know, keep the patient first and remember that they're a person, not just a disorder. Find your passion and pursue that passion. And I think the third part is be a part of a really great team or build a really great team. You know, think about the work culture that you want to have and work hard to build that culture and surround yourself with great people who also buy into that culture. You know, I think a lot of our success here in Zambia has really been that everyone has bought into this culture of working hard, working hard for our patients, but also enjoying our work and enjoying our colleagues and supporting each other. And so I think that it's so important to really think consciously and really, you know, pointedly about the culture that you're in and working to improve or build a culture that is supportive and fun and makes it so that you don't dread going to work, right? That you enjoy going to work, you enjoy the people that you're working with. And that just makes you, I think, an even better doctor when you're happy being at work. So thank you for taking the time. I know it is probably the middle of the night in Zambia right now. Once again, I've been speaking with Deanna Saylor from Johns Hopkins University, currently based out of Zambia. She is this year's winner of the Ted Burns Humanism and Neurology Award. I really appreciate you sharing just a little bit of your journey and, and some pearls of wisdom, Deanna, and congratulations again. Thank you so much, Stacey. This has been a lovely time. And for our audience, you can find information on Deanna and also the Ted Burns Award on the American Brain Foundation webpage. You can just Google that American Brain Foundation Ted Burns Award will probably bring it up. While you're there, feel free to click on the link. You can donate to recognize Deanna, Ted, our prior winners as well. And if you are at the American Academy of Neurology meeting in Boston this year, Deanna will also be honored at the Commitment to Cures dinner Wednesday evening in Boston. So please feel free to join us there. Thank you again and congratulations. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.